this morning. I want to follow along as I read the scripture lesson that's taken from Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 23 and reading through the first half of verse 25a. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 25a. We are talking about the name of Jesus. I hope as we sing that song each week, you really are catching on to what the words say. And I just tell you, anything you need in your life, you can have it in the name of Jesus. It's there. And I love that last part. He's the way, the truth, the life. He's the only way to God. Is it the name of Jesus? All we need. So as we're continuing in this series on the name of Jesus this morning, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to be looking at how Jesus is our Redeemer. Let's begin by reading our scripture lesson, Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 25, or the first half of verse 25. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. This is the Word of God for the people of God. May God add His blessing to the reading and hearing of His Word this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning and thank you for the message it contains for all of our hearts. Anoint me once again by the power of your Holy Spirit to stand as one chosen and called to proclaim your word to your people. To stand as one who correctly handles the word of truth. Let this message be your message and not mine. Oh God, give us a word today that your people might hear it, receive it, and live. Let your word not return to you void, but accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So, I'm going to put up, I'm going to have uh, Eric put up a couple of slides real quick. The first slide, there's a story behind this, not particularly this Mustang, but this Mustang represents what the story talks about. My nephew, when he was about 14 and, a half, 14 and a half years of age or so, told his daddy he wanted a Mustang. He didn't want one of the new Mustangs. He wanted an old classic Mustang. And uh, he was going to save up the money to buy it. And you know, you know how that story goes. Well, he came home from school one day and he said, Hey, Dad, look, I found an ad for a Mustang in restorable condition. And I've got enough money to buy it. Well, my brother-in-law did, <laughs> brother did his best to try to explain to him restorable condition doesn't mean drivable condition. Uh, but Jeffrey, I mean, that's the one he wanted. So uh, he'd never seen it. He just knew he had the money to buy it. Well, one afternoon, my brother-in-law comes driving down the hill in front of their house with my dad's big car hauler trailer hooked behind his truck, and there's this Mustang that looked a whole lot like this on that trailer, and Jeffrey said, what is that? He said, that's your Mustang in restorable condition. <laughs> he said, now we have about a year and a half to get it in restored and drivable condition. So they worked in their garage just about every spare minute that they had. And this next picture is not his Mustang, but it is a picture similar to what that Mustang looked like when they were done. Jeffrey was so proud of that car, he drove it to school once. <laughs> and then he bought him a little Dodge pickup so he could leave his Mustang at home because he was afraid somebody would pull in the park next to him in the school parking lot open their door and name his door and there, there would be his beautiful restored Mustang um, 
with dents and scratches. And so they parked it. And after Jeff and Brittany got married, uh, he ended up selling his Mustang for a whole lot more than what he paid for it in restorable condition. Pastor, what in the world does this have to do with us? Here, come back up the slide. That's us before Jesus. That Mustang doesn't look the way it looked when it rolled off the line at the assembly plant in 1965, does it? Friends, because of sin, we don't look like how we were created. Uh, let's look again at, at uh, verse 23. I'm going to quote it there. Go ahead and go to Genesis chapter 1. Keep going. I got to head myself. I'm letting her catch up. There we go. Romans chapter 3, we started off and it read, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, I was reminded this week of what that meant. Not that I've necessarily forgotten, but reminded and it was put to me in a way that I'd never uh, perhaps understood it that way. Not to say I agreed with everything, but uh, here, here's a very important part. If we look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27... It's the more detailed uh, narrative of the creation of humankind. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. In the other account, it says God took the dust and he formed man from the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils and Adam became a living being. Folks, let me tell you what it doesn't say. My friend Dennis and I had a few conversations about this this weekend. We are created in God's image and in God's likeness, but we are not created with all of the attributes of God. Okay? God was before time. God will be forever. We were created six days after God began creation. We are not on the cross, which means we're not for all time. God is. God is omniscient. God knew everything from the beginning. And he will know everything for all time. But Adam and Eve didn't even realize they were naked. Adam and Eve knew no shame for their nakedness. Because Adam and Eve didn't have knowledge of good and evil. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. Adam and Eve, they were placed in the Garden of Eden and that's where they were. They weren't in America. They weren't in Europe. They were somewhere in what we understand to be the continent of the northern African continent and up in that area around as best as we can tell from reading scripture and trying to trace landmarks. Up around the Euphrates and the Tigris River. But they were there. They weren't everywhere else. God is omnipotent. God is all powerful. God was powerful enough to take a lump of dirt and make a living, breathing human being. Adam was not. So you see, we're created in God's image. We're created in God's likeness. But we weren't created with all the attributes of God. One of the attributes of God we were not created with was we were not immortal. Big conversation about that. Were Adam and Eve created as immortal beings? And the answer, if you read the scripture, is no. See, one of the trees that God planted in the, in the Garden of Eden that is specifically mentioned is the tree of life. Because all of creation was dependent on God 
for its life. When Adam and Eve sinned, you can read that whole story in Genesis chapter 3. I'm not going to go through it. We've read it many, many times. But one of the pieces that we don't always focus on is right at the end of the story. God says to Adam, from the earth you came to the earth you're going to return, dust to dust. You remember all that? And then he forces Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden and he places a guard, a creature that is described in the book of Genesis. He places that guard at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. Why? So that the man cannot reach out and also take of the tree of life and become like us, living forever. See, we weren't created anymore. One of the gifts that God gave to Adam and Eve was the expectation, God's expectation, that they would live forever because of His blessing. Part of the curse for us is that that blessing was taken away for the first time. Death. The curse of death was known to human God. We were a lot like that old Mustang that we looked at the picture of. We no longer look like how we were created. You know what happens to an old car that just sits out in the weeds? It just keeps deteriorating. The tires continue to rot and fall apart. The rust continues to eat through the metal. And it just continues to decay and to disintegrate. What do you think happens to us in our sin? If we just continue to live in our sin and, and, and live with our sin and allow our sin to continue to have its effect on us. I have, uh, if you need a, a good image of that, just look at the world around us. Look at how evil the world is. Look at how evil men and women have become. Oh, wait. This is going to hurt for a minute. Sometimes we don't even have to look outside the four walls of the church to see the effects of sin. When we allow sin to continue to work in our lives, we continue to look more and more like that old Mustang. It's a crude illustration, but at least it's one that we can put in our minds and kind of understand, right? Well, today I want to talk about Jesus Christ as our Redeemer, and I'm going to make this as short and as sweet as, as I can. Um, we, we kind of just went through very quickly the need for redemption. Why do we need redemption? How many of us want to be that old decrepit, disintegrating self? Living under the curse. Hmm? I don't see any hands because none of us really want to be that. So there, we understand the need for redemption. Well, I know from hanging out at Jeff's house for a while, uh, number two, I'm sorry. They had to take that Mustang into the garage in its broken down shape when it looked like this. And they had to tear it all apart. And as they were tearing it apart, they had to start saying, okay, we're going to need to buy this, and we're going to need to buy this, and we're going to need to send this off to the fabricator and have them do this because of the, the new laws, if you remember the old Coney uh, car problem of the exploding gas tanks. Uh, now if you're restoring a, a Ford Coney car, you've got to put in a, a protection shield between the gas tank and the passenger area that weren't originally there. You have, sometimes have to have those uh, custom fabricated to, to fit the car if there's been any modification to it. Uh, and all those things. And they had to sit. They had to make a plan. And they had 
tear the motor apart, figure out what needed to be fixed and what needed to be put back together. And the aftermarket parts that needed to be taken off and replaced with uh, more of a factory type of parts. But they had to have a plan in order to take that on Mustang and make it look like that. God had to have a plan to take what we made ourselves with sin. God had to have a plan to take us from the old, decrepit, sinful man and restore us to how He had designed us. Remember, we were created in God's image and in God's likeness. But all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Well, here in verse 24, we read God's plan. Preacher, just a little while ago, I heard, he said, we, he said, so many people can quote you Romans chapter 3, verse 23, but they forget that there's a comma at the end of 23, not a period. That's an important statement. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. What was God's plan? God's plan was to redeem us through Jesus Christ. So you can sum up God's plan in two words. Redeeming grace. We love to talk about saving grace, don't we? We love to talk about being saved. We love to talk about God's saving grace. But folks, I want to tell you something. God had more of a plan than just to save you from your sins. God had a plan to redeem you. To redeem me. To take everything that was tearing us apart and destroying who He created us to be and to redeem it and recreate us through His grace. Uh, grace is often defined this way. God's redemption at Christ's expense. Jesus paid the price for our redemption. And so you can sum up God's plan in two words. Redeeming grace. But in order for God's redeeming grace to take place, for it, in order for that to happen, there had to be a provision. And this is where we get to our theme for today. Because the provision for God's plan we find in Romans chapter 24 or Romans chapter 3 verses 24 but specifically in verse 25 uh, beginning with verse 23 again for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus and here's the, here's the provision God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. Pastor, why did Jesus have it? Why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Why did Jesus have to shed His blood for us? Well, the biblical writer answers that question for us when we uh, continue to look at the Scriptures. In Hebrews, he says, but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves. Every year, for thousands of years, the goats and the calves were sacrificed. As the sin offering. You remember that? Every year. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremony, ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences, or cleanse our consciences? 
from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it because the will is enforced only when someone has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. You understand what he's talking about when, he's, when he talks about the first covenant? He's talking about the covenant with Moses. That God was going to redeem the people of Israel. <laughs> How many years had they been in bondage in Egypt? He had delivered them. He had called them out of Egypt, out of the bonds of slavery. They were in the wilderness and God made a covenant with them. The, the, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting what was constructed. Does the kind of glory of God fill that tabernacle? And God made covenant with His people that He would redeem His people once again. And that covenant was made by blood. If you read Dr. Richter, or Sandy Richter's book, Epic of Eden, or you do that Bible study where she talks about the cutting of the covenant, you understand how important the cutting of a covenant was in, in the ancient Near East. Not just in, the, in terms of God's people, but in, in, in other peoples as well. The person receiving the blessing would offer a sacrifice. And that sacrifice would be cut head to tail and laid in half. And as the person receiving the blessing of the covenant would pass through the pieces and walk through the blood, they would recite the covenant. There are only, only, there's only one time in Scripture when the person offering the sacrifice is the one who made the covenant. And that is when God made covenant with us to redeem us, not just to save us from our sin, but to redeem us by the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross of Calvary. Not just to give us fire insurance, as a friend of mine says. There are a lot of people who like fire insurance. Salvation will save us from an eternity in hell. But God wants so much more for us than that. God wants to redeem us. God wants not just to save us so we don't burn in hell forever. God wants to redeem in us what He created in us. And what was that? His image and His likeness. Does it happen just like that? Nope. I don't think anybody can ever say it again. Now, I've heard some amazing stories of how God has begun that transformation process. I've heard of people with thousands of dollars a day in drug habits who went to an altar and prayed and God delivered them and they, they stood up and they never touched another drug or never dropped another drop of alcohol and they never went through any withdrawal or DTs or anything. And I always hear those stories and, and some of these people I know personally and I know it to be true and I'm like, wow. But I also know that even that was at the end of their story. I can tell you that's not my story. Yes, I got up from an altar of prayer when I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior and immediately, you know, I was a new creation. But I was kind of like that caterpillar that went into the cocoon. I'm in this cocoon called life and God's doing some work on me. So that when I come out of this life with a glorified body and a glorified, the glorified person he's created me to be, then I'll be perfect. But my perfection, my transformation, my redemption, friends, it, it's already 30 something years in the work and knows how long God's going to keep working before he says, okay, I'm ready to bring you home. But 
Jesus Christ had to suffer. His blood had to be shed for us. That was the plan. That's the plan for our redemption. It's driving me nuts when so many people want to stop talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. Because I want to, I want to point out one thing that is said at the end in verse 22. See if we can get there. There we go. This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. This is what Moses said to the people. And, and Moses sprinkled the blood on the tabernacle and everything that would be used for its ceremonies under the first covenant. But in fact... In verse 22, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. Why? Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Why did Jesus Christ have to die on the cross? Why did Jesus Christ have to shed his blood for us? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. <clears throat> we could never offer enough sacrifices. God offered one sacrifice once and for all. The shedding of Christ, Christ's blood. That yes, our sins can be forgiven. But so that we can also be redeemed. So we don't have to live the rest of our lives saved. I, 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 another crude illustration of using the Mustangs. You know, I can go... I, I could go down to the junkyard and I could find a, a Mustang that looked like that. That was, you know, on the slate to be put in the crusher and destroyed. And I could go to the owner of the junkyard and I could say, how much do you want for that? And I could pay him that price and I could save that Mustang from being crushed and I could take it home and I could park it in my yard and never do a thing with it. I saved it. But I would not have redeemed. I would not have restored it. Until it went through the process to come out looking. Like my nephew's Mustang looked when they got that. Do you understand? It's a crude illustration. But it's the difference between simply being saved and being redeemed. And some people would like to say that they're one and the same. I would argue that they're not. Because you can be saved. I'll tell you this, you can be saved. And your life can never be transformed. Believe me, I know a lot of people who fit that category. And that's not being judgmental. I don't have to be judgmental about that. Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruit. When we have Christians who are saved, but their lives and the way they live their lives looks just like people in the world, they can say they're saved, but they can't say they've been redeemed. I heard one old preacher say it this way, and then I'm going to go to my last slide. He said, if your life after Christ still looks like your life before Christ, there has been no transformation through Christ. Just think about that. If your life after Christ still looks like your life before Christ, there has been no transformation through Christ. There's been no restoration. There's been no redeeming and no restoration of the image of God, the glory of God that we were created with if we still look and act like we did before Christ. Again, not everybody's going to have that light switch moment. But if we've been Christians for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, there should be enough difference in our lives for people to be able to tell that we're Christians just by how we live. Amen. We are out. Well, Pastor, how do I know? Read your Bible. Read your Bible. 
It tells us what the acts of the sinful nature will look like. If those are the things that still characterize our life, then there's not been any redemption or transformation. It also tells us what the fruit of the Spirit will be. What will our lives look like when Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are transforming us to who God wants us to be? Friends, none of us get the fruit of the Spirit perfect. None of us get the, the none of us will ever get it perfect. I, I'm convinced of that. But we should look a whole lot more like a transformed human person after Christ than we do the one before Christ. We might be saved, but have we been redeemed? We might have let the saving work of grace take place in our life, but have we allowed the sanctifying, redeeming work of Christ to take place in our life? If we, look so, if we look more like the world than we do Jesus, the answer is no. If our lives look just look the same way after Christ as they did before Christ, then there's been no transforming work of Christ in our lives. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by grace through redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. So how do we start this process? Many of us already have. It. Many of us sitting here today, many watching online, we've already started the process. Starting the process is as easy as ABC. Don't think I need to tell you that. Admit that you're a sinner and you need a Savior to forgive your sins. Believe that Jesus Christ died to forgive the world and sins to forgive you of your sins. <coughs> Confess your sins to Jesus Christ. Claim the forgiveness that He purchased for you when He shed His blood on the cross and confess Him as your Savior. Too many times we stop there. That's just the beginning. There's so much more He wants for us after that. He wants to redeem us. He wants to transform us. He wants to take that old way of living and transform it into something that looks more like Him. He wants to take away the acts of the sinful nature. And he wants us to, he wants to help us live according to the Holy Spirit and, and, and look like a transformed, redeemed, restored person in the image and likeness of God. So what about you? What about you? I can't answer the question, I can answer the question for me. I'll be honest enough to tell you, I am very aware that in my life there are still areas that need to be transformed, areas where God's redeeming work is still taking place in my life. What about you? Are there still some areas in your life, even though you're saved, even though you're a Christian, are there still some areas in your life where God needs to be allowed to to do his redeeming work. Pastor, what do you mean God needs to be allowed? God is a gentleman. God will not force you to allow him to do the work that he wants to do in your life. Do you understand that? He won't force you to let him do it. But if you'll choose to allow him to do it, he will do it completely. That's why we're told that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. He will completely restore and transform what we will allow Him to read. This morning we're going to sing just as I am. We're not going to sing the whole thing. We'll just sing one verse a cappella. Because I want to give you an opportunity to, to respond. If the Lord is speaking to you, and He's saying to you, hey, 
here's some areas in your life that I, that I want to redeem. I don't want to just save you. I want to redeem you. And here's some areas that I want to work on. If he's saying that to you this morning, and you want to say, Lord, okay. If you want to, I'm willing to let you. Then I only invite you to come and pray. Yes, you can pray in your seats. You can. I still believe there's something to be said for responding to the call of the Holy Spirit by humbling ourselves and coming to an altar and saying, Lord, here I am. I'm coming just as I am, and I'm going to let you do what you want to do. Because I'm also convinced that this, the, the biggest thing that holds us in our seats when an invitation is given is sin. The hardest sin for any human being to overcome, and that's the sin of pride that's too afraid to respond because we're afraid of what everybody else might think. It's been said, I'd rather be, I'd rather I'd rather be honest before God and be judged by men. I said that. I can't remember how it says, but the gist of it is this. I'd rather be saved and and not have to be judged by God than, be judged, than worry about being judged by me. I'm, I'm more concerned about what God thinks than what man thinks. So if the Lord speaks this morning, we're going to say one person and we're done. I invite you to come. And just pray. And say, Lord, you're telling me there are some areas in my life that need to be redeemed. And I'm coming to offer you those areas in my life. Would you stay? Let's sing. Just as I am. Would you join us as we uh, offer our, this benediction and blessing to one another? <clears throat> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, friends. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday, if not before.